Hello, it's me, Nikki Newman from the Standard Issue podcast. You may recognise my voice. I hope you do. I hope you listen. If you don't, please do. Uh, but you might be like, what is this face? Uh, this is my face. Hi. Uh, why is my face? Now, that is it's a complicated question, but to answer you as to why it's on YouTube right now, September the 30th, 2024 is Standard Issue's 10th birthday. I know, time. It flies. I'm not the first person to say that. We're all aware of the passage of time. And yeah, it still takes us by surprise. Anyway, we decided that what would be good to celebrate a decade of championing women is to one, be able to say that better, still working on that, but two, to pick some of our favourite interviews from the past decade to put on YouTube with a little intro as to why we picked them. Now, this one, actually, maybe I didn't need to say championing women because I'm actually talking to a man. I know, a man. Who'd have thought it? Well, we thought it every year to mark International Men's Day. And in this episode, which you're about to listen to, I had a frank and frankly heartbreaking conversation with Luke Hart, who is a domestic violence campaigner and alongside his brother, Ryan, co-author of the book Operation Lighthouse. Operation Lighthouse tells a story about how Luke and Ryan's mum, Claire, and their sister, Charlotte, were murdered by their dad. Now, as regular listeners will know, I have done a lot of interviews around coercive control, domestic violence, domestic homicide. It is a problem that is not going away anytime soon, sadly. And women have been screaming, shouting, yelling about this for decades, centuries even. And yet real change isn't going to happen unless the men got on board. And so it felt important to talk to Luke, who is so clear headed in how he thinks things need to shift, particularly given what he and his family have been through. Please, if you like what we're doing, smash that subscribe button and thank you very much for listening. I am joined by Luke Hart, domestic violence campaigner and co-author of Operation Lighthouse with his younger brother, Ryan. Hey, Luke. Hey, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Mickey. It's good to be here. It's great to have you, but it is an incredibly sad story, which is the reason that we're talking to you. I'll just do a brief summary of what happened. On July the 19th, 2016, in a swimming pool car park in Spalding, Lincolnshire, Lance Hart murdered his wife, Claire, and daughter, Charlotte, before turning the gun on himself. Claire was your mum, yeah. Charlotte, your little sister, and Lance, your father. Mm-hmm. Operation Lighthouse which started off just between you and Ryan as letters where you were sort of talking through your emotions and feelings around what had happened to you, is the sharing of that story. Why did you decide to share your story? Initially, we were struck with shock, as you'd expect, when we found out. So we were both working abroad. Ryan was in Holland and I was in Scotland when we both found out. And we just, we came back to Spalding, we flew back. And for the first week or two weeks, the police were just driving us around took us to the morgue, were taking us through victim statements, and we were just like zombies. They told us not to look at the press, because it was obviously a national event, and there was a lot of press coverage of it. And I totally ignored it. I just didn't want anything going on. I just couldn't handle day-to-day. But Ryan started to look, and he was furious, and started showing me some of the stuff that he was seeing. Mm -hmm. I guess to summarise it, It was almost like being back at the dinner table and having our father shouting his world at us and our mum's sister in silence. And it just felt like exactly that being replicated. A lot of what we were reading was our father's perspective through bystanders. So, you know, people saying he was a good man, he was good at DIY. We even saw in one report it said it was understandable what our father had done. Generally, it was his worldview was explaining his actions and trying to rationalise them. People were trying to find logic to what he'd done, asking people on the street what he was like, and it was just his version of events. I mean, it was even his language, so he wrote a 12-page suicide note, is what the media called it. You also call it a murder note, though. Yeah, I I mean, it's a suicide note to him, but it was a murder note to our mum's sister and to us. And we were forced to read a story that started when we left our father and finished when he killed our own sister. But our story was 25 years long, and unfortunately, that was invisible. I understand it's hard for the media to know what's going on in coercive control and domestic abuse relationships, but no one even mentioned domestic abuse. Everyone was trying to fob it off. It wasn't even covered in the news stories. 
And we just found that it wasn't just an ignorance of victims' perspectives. It was a total denial of victims' existence. And to us, that was like hugely... I mean, we've, we were traumatised almost more by the way it was reported, the way that mum and child were wiped, and our father was given a public funeral. He was eulogised by people and passers-by, and we just... It made us so angry because it was unrepresentative of our mother, our sister, our struggles. It was almost just forgiving him, and we, we will never forgive him. And to see everyone else forgive our father for what he did was just unbearable. And it's not an unusual take by the media at all. So at the moment, Craig Savage, who is currently on trial for the murder of his estranged wife, Michelle, and her mum, Heather Whitbread, was been described as a jilted lover or mm -hmm. seeking reconciliation when he went to their house with a shotgun and executed them. Why do you think people are so desperate to put the onus on the victims rather than to talk about the murderer? I think a couple of things. There's one is that domestic abuse is like... We, I mean, we talk about it in some way, but I think we deny its true magnitude because one in four women in the UK will suffer domestic abuse in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. That in itself means that it should almost be a conversation we hear about all of the time. Like yeah. Most people have an experience or know someone very close to them that have an experience. Most kids are going to grow up knowing someone or having experienced it themselves, but we just don't talk about it. And I think that it's really difficult because if we did talk about it, we would realise that it's effectively one of the biggest social problems that we have. And what's really difficult about it is that it's gendered almost entirely in the fact that it's men controlling and killing women. And unfortunately, the children get brought into that, as Charlotte did in our case, because they're pawns to these men to control the women. And the fact that over 100 women are killed a year, two a week, it's bigger than any terrorist event, more than there's you know, religious ideology divisions in our society or whatever divisions you could draw. The biggest war or terrorist event is men killing women in our country. And it's kind of ignored in the fact that we kind of treat each one as an isolated event. It's a personal family problem that got out of control. It's a man trying to compromise or find some way of resolving his relationship problems. But it's not. It's societal, but it's just manifested at home because we do nothing to stop it. It's so easy to manifest that gender violence at home. It'd be really hard to do it in the street. But unfortunately, people don't look through doors, the laws don't get through the doors, and the men can do what they want. And that's why it's so difficult, because I think if we accepted it, it would mean that the home lost its kind of sovereignty and the family yeah. is a really important part of society and for some people it works really well but for some people it totally fails and when the family fails no one dares to intervene and it's just a nightmare to be in that situation I'd like to come back to the language used around domestic violence and some of the words that you just used which I think are the right words terrorism and it's gendered but before that what you've just said about the family and closed doors is really vitally important because it took until after your mum and sister were murdered for you and Ryan to even realise what had been happening in your lives. Yeah. Could you talk us through how you worked out how long you'd been being abused? Yeah, sure. So we had grown up under our father's narratives, the world that he'd constructed. But as children, we believed everything we were told by our father. So mm. children are... In a way, they're shaped, they're given boundaries by the important figures in their life. Generally, it's a man who is the authoritative figure, and you kind of learn your morals and boundaries from him. So as children, we grew up and learned what we could. We knew our father was immoral, though. There was that gut instinct, that how he treated our family, controlling us psychologically, emotionally abusing us, taking, you know, just restricting our lives, taking money, taking um, our hobbies away from us felt horrible but we just felt like we couldn't challenge it because our father never hit us and we felt that domestic abuse was being hit that's what we saw in the media and what we also saw in the media is this emotive language about men losing it about men snapping about this kind of stuff but our father was almost like cold-hearted about it and we didn't think that was domestic abuse because it wasn't this kind of snapping and violence that we were kind of conditioned to believe was domestic violence so we grew up thinking our father was just a bad man. We didn't realise he was dangerous. Mm -hmm. 
we broke our mum and sister out of the house because our mother eventually, after me and Ryan had gone to work, we'd raised enough money, she eventually had the financial ability to leave. Growing up, she didn't. Our mum had MS, so multiple sclerosis, and she only earned about 6000 a year. She worked part-time, and she didn't have any qualifications. So she was she did everything she, everything she could. She was an incredible mother, but she just didn't have the health or the education, which is not her fault at all, to earn money. And she couldn't look after three children growing up. So only when Ryan and I had raised enough money were we able to support our mother, was she able to leave. But our father, towards the end of the relationship, was getting more and more controlling. And he even had a safe in the garage that he chained up part of our mother's passports, her driver's licence, her birth certificate. Her freedom, basically. Her freedom was almost chained up in the garage. She could see her life chained there as if she was like a spider in his web almost. And we realised that we couldn't let her go through divorce proceedings with him like this in the house, so controlling. We didn't think he was going to hurt her, but we thought he's going to find some way of stopping her leaving. So we got our mum and sister out because we thought that was the most civil way for them to go through divorce proceedings. So Ryan and I, when our mother um, was at work and our father at work, collected our mother in a moving van, went home, got some only a few pieces of furniture, took it to a rental house that we secretly got for our mother and sister and just and and started started their new life there and it was only five days later that we got the call that our mum and sister had been shot by our father and it was only a day afterwards when we were sat in Spalding in the police station and we looked up behind us there was a poster on the wall and all it said was coercive control and behavior it became against the law six months before yeah the end of 2015 the yeah. end of 2015 it only just become against the law and it just named almost like it was almost like a personality description of our father like uh, his sort of CV it was like financial abuse restricting hobbies or access to social media or the internet or all of these kind of things that you you just you appreciate to be immoral and kind of intangible personality traits but as part of a system of behavior they're designed to control someone and we'd never thought that people hurt other people because they want to control them We'd never thought someone would ever do that. You know, we thought, how can someone in a clear mind kill other people? But it's only afterwards that we've come to realise that controlling behaviour is at the root of all domestic abuse. Like most domestic homicides have, an, well, almost all of them have control as an aspect throughout the relationship, yeah. but not all of them have violence. And unfortunately, our father had managed to create such mechanisms and levers of control that he never had to be violent. And we saw that lack of violence as meaning we were safe. But what it meant was we were so imprisoned, he didn't need to be violent. He'd managed to condition us to imprison ourselves. Like, we were often restricting things before our father even had to say a word. So even towards the end, a fly on the wall wouldn't have even seen our father do anything because it was so embedded, we'd got to the point of being our own prisoners and jail keepers. We were, we were just restricting ourselves to the point where he just had to sit back and saw it happen. Because you normalised it as a survival instinct. Mm. If you normalise it and get used to his behaviour, then the, it became less. And he very much acted like he owned your family. That's right. And he'd actually been plotting against all of you for quite a while, hadn't he? Yeah, that's right. So, again, we after the police investigation, our father had written this murder note, as we said. It's a 12-page murder note. And the police took his computers and looked through all of the past information they could find in the house. And they saw that on this computer, he'd, he'd been writing murder notes for weeks, but before we'd even planned to leave. So what was told in the media was our father's story, our father's perspective, us leaving triggering a series of events. But that wasn't true at all, because what we found is that our father was writing a murder note before we'd even left. So our father, in effect, had triggered us to leave. But what happened was he was updating his justification in each draft, and actually his justifications were flimsy until we left. And then he changed his justification to, my family have left, blah, 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 now I'm going to kill you. But that suited him, and the media just played to that entirely. Yeah. And unfortunately, we had to read this at the time and sort of feel a sense of guilt. But when we saw, that it was just like... The fact that the media was just our father's mouthpiece and we realised how powerful that is because another thing we found was that our father had been looking on the internet in his Google search history at men who killed their families for months before he even started writing his murder note. And unfortunately, as you've mentioned already, a lot of these media reports 
are from the male perspective. They're using male language and male rationale to explain and sympathise and rationalise with ma- male perspectives. Our father would have read that, gone, oh, if I kill my family, I'm going to get a pretty decent go in the press yeah. here. And he did. He got eulogised in the press. When you consider that domestic abuse isn't due to emotion, it's due to control, and control is facilitated by belief systems that say it's okay to control and hurt people, then to tell people, as the media do, that it's okay and to rationalise it just feeds that loop and creates more and more. One of the things that we found really difficult was some of the arguments that were put forward for our father, like, did he have a hard childhood? were really strange coming to us who clearly had a hard yeah, childhood. Yeah, how was your childhood, Luke? Uh, oh, it's great, yeah. <laughs> so we were like, what is your, what's the, what's the rationale here? Like, are you telling us we can go and do this? Or are you, what, like, what is the language? And also, a lot of the excuses that are used, so mental health is one that I absolutely despise, poverty, divorce, etc., etc., and all these kind of problems. People use them as a reason for domestic abuse or domestic homicide. But actually... They're only reasons for men to kill. They're not reasons for women to kill. A lot of the language that you see, the excusing kind of language, only suits the male narrative. And it doesn't fit when you look at the fact that women don't kill men when they grow up in poverty. When they've got horrendous mental health because they've been abused for decades. And it's just really unfair. And one of the other things that we really think is that it sets a really low bar for men. Yeah. Like when you see yeah. this language, it kind of makes you ashamed to be a man. It's like, how do I leave this club? Like, I don't want to be involved anymore because it's basically been driven into the dirt and people are still saying, what a good man. And you think, how is it possible to be a bad man? Like, what do you have to do? <laughs> yeah, good question. It's toxic and you also refer to it as regressed masculinity. Yeah. That seems to get championed. I know. Like, poor men. Oh, poor men. It's understandable and searching for this justification. So to go back into the language, it's Mm. also quite often described as an isolated incident, Mm. which is untrue because two women a week are dying at the hands of their partner or their ex-partner. And it's also referred to as, like, a momentary loss of control Mm. when, as you've just so articulately described, it is incredibly controlling. Exactly. Particularly at that moment. Yeah, and that's what, like, all of the language that the media uses is so different to the language of people that study this day in, day out. You read the media and it's all about this emotional excuse and this momentary loss of control. But all of the kind of criminology studies say that this is based on planning. In general, this is always planned. And the fact that, unfortunately, in our case, our mum and sister were killed after they left. Up to 75% of women who are murdered are killed after they leave. So the point is these women are hunted down more often than not. So the fact that these women are hunted down means it's not a loss of control because you can't lose your control and then go and find people and then kill them. That does not work, especially, as you said, if you're turning up with a shotgun or a knife or you're breaking in, as often happens. You cannot call that a loss of control. And in fact, your father demonstrated an excess of control, which is how you describe it in Operation Lighthouse, to the point that even in his, you call it a murder note and also an entitled suicide note, which yeah. again is a great way of phrasing it, to asking the police not to break the door down. We've provided the keys. That, I mean, that that is so controlling. He's even trying to control the fucking police at this point. <laughs> it's incredible. They didn't take any notice though, right? No, that's right. So yeah, so what we found, it made us feel sick that our father who could kill our mum and sister and claim he was non-violent in his murder note, and then to the police, write in his murder note, like, I'm a good man, here's the keys, please, Mr Police, don't break the door down, here's everything you need, and even wrote an excuse for the marijuana they'd find in the car and in the house that it was medicinal, which it wasn't at all. We didn't even know he had it. He was basically, like, sucking up to the police. And then the police, obviously, I don't know if they'd seen the letter or not before, but they bashed the shit out of the door <laughs> and there was um, shards everywhere and, and to be honest that was one of the things that first made me and Ryan kind of laugh and break through the absurdity of our yeah. father because out of everything that his life tried to achieve he was just trying to protect a door <laughs> like I mean how can a man care about a door more than anything else in his life and it was just so absurd and see this door in fragments was just brilliant because we just thought there's your last wish and there it's scattered across the drive and to us it was just uh, it was it was unbelievable and one thing i've found since is that men that murder their wives or their families often are incredibly submissive to male authority 
And our father demonstrated that in the way that he responded to the police. Yeah. But what these men do is they take it out on women. These men see the world as highly structured and hierarchical. And kids and women belong to men in the home. But the, the police or whatever is, a, is an overarching authority to, them, to the men. And they often behave well in prison, for example, these men particularly who kill their families. But it was just childish to see this written in his murder note, like articulating murder and then the last bit, please don't break the door. And to us, it was just, I think that just shows how obscene these, these men are and just how deluded they are, really. And going back to the language used about isolated incidents, the other thing that really struck me from Operation Lighthouse, which is a difficult but amazing read, it's, it's incredible, was that the estate agents had done it all before. When you were moving your mum and sister, when you were moving Claire and Charlotte, they knew you felt like they'd, they'd done this before, yeah. which puts the lie to it being an isolated incident. Exactly. And I think that's what really struck us, for example, is that we thought it was an isolated incident, but it was only towards the end that we realised that this is... It's like an underculture that's never spoken about. There's almost... Below the level of society, there's a stream of refugees in our own country, women and children yeah. escaping from their homes. And when we went to the estate agents, our father was selling our house because he wanted to downsize and take our mother away from us. But our mother was obviously trying to divorce him. But our mother had to go with the narrative because our father would obviously escalate if she was like trying to confront him about it. So we, in the meantime, went to go and find somewhere for her to rent so that she could move away during the divorce. But we were doing it with the same estate agents. So they had to kind of build a wall to stop the information from accidentally right. leaking to our father while... We were trying to find somewhere for our mother. But the fact that these systems are set up and these people are used to it kind of shows that we're forcing people who have no expertise in domestic abuse to facilitate escapes of people when this should surely be part of some societal support mechanism or something. And the same with the locksmith. When we were trying to break into the safe that our father had in the garage, it mm -hmm. had all of our mother's documents in it. We only had like two hours to get it before our father came back for lunch. And we had to call locksmith. I was like, please come over straight away. And he saw us packing everything into the moving van. As he came up, we were sweating. And it was clear what was going on. But he just saw it. And in his eyes, it was like, a, oh, I've been here before. And he was just like, show me where it is. So I went round. He saw the safe. Without any questions at all, we just opened it. Went, there you go, mate. Paid. And off he went. And it was so clear at that moment that, like, this isn't rare either. And I was just thinking, how many times do locksmiths have to, like, break women out of, like, a home or whatever or break them in somewhere so they can escape? And you sort of think, it's really strange. Like, the idea of, a like, a home being a prison just struck me, like, so much in that moment. The fact that that's kind of what our home was. And there was this locksmith kind of breaking us out. And I just wondered... This has got to be happening to so many families, but unfortunately, it's an isolated incident. No one talks about it. We're embarrassed about it when actually it's a societal problem that we kind of just haven't elevated to that level properly. We leave people to just deal with it themselves, which is doesn't help at all because you can't escape like we saw. There's a line in the book and it says, the truth for many is that we can't stay and we can't leave. Mm. When you were breaking your mum and Charlotte out, that was the positive. You were actually able to do that. But as you've touched on before, in coercive control relationships, there are so many women and children who are in those relationships and don't even realise it. Exactly. Which and, is why yeah. the narrative has to change, right? Exactly. And that's, that's one of the things that's key, I think, to start, is that we found it's really common for people to be in the same situation that we are. Our father, for example, like I said, he'd... Um, He'd executed control almost textbook with our mother. So we only found out when we got our mother out that our father had been married to another lady when he met our mother. Mm -hmm. That was kept secret for 26 years. Our father refused anyone externally to tell us, and he kept it quiet as well. So when we had our mother in the moving van, that was when she told us. And we were like, well, that's weird, but fine. Yeah. But it was only when we found out that the reason he left um, his previous wife to meet our mother was because she wouldn't have a child with him. And when he met our mother he immediately threw away our mother's conceptive pills and said, you're having my child, and that was me. Fucking so that was an immediate reaction because he knew that women, to be controlled, must have dependents. They must have children, I suppose. He just knew that. And then at the age of three, our family moved from where we were with family and friends in a small town to the middle of nowhere to a rundown farmhouse. And that move was as a consequence of me having an anaphylactic shock to nuts. So I was told that I had this accidentally eating nuts. Um, I had this anaphylactic shock. I was rushed to hospital. My life was saved. 
and our father had said that we were moving to this rundown farmhouse so we could just grow our own food because we grew our own food i'd never accidentally eat nuts again we'd know what we're eating and everything would be fine i'd be safe and we believed that because we had no other reason we were children right and then only after the murders did it come out that when I was three, it was already known I had a nut allergy, and my father had fed peanuts to me in front of my mother to demonstrate control over my life, I suppose. And he'd used that incident to force my mother to move to this rundown farmhouse. So he kind of used the abuse as a threat and leverage to abuse further. Yeah. And with, by the age of me being three, he'd got a child with our mother, forced her to get married effectively, and then isolated her. And when we lived in this rundown farmhouse, our, neither of our parents worked for 10 years. We just grew our own food. It was proper subsistence. But for 10 years, our mother didn't have a job. She was isolated. By that point, the world is is missing to her. She was just there. Yeah. And growing up as kids, we were told the reasons that things happened in our life. There's a, there's a bunch of other ones. But that effectively shows how you can be told something. You have no way of challenging or really understanding what's behind it. And our father used these kind of mechanisms constantly to, to like, Truman show us in a way. Like, this is what's happening. But we were basically acting out his kind of world. And it was and another thing he did, for example, was he used to, like, he didn't work much, obviously. And he used to waste money constantly. But he used our lack of money as an excuse so that we couldn't go out, so we couldn't go and do stuff. So even to the point where we only ever heated the living room in the house, so we had to sit within his view because he would follow us around the house. Okay. So, like, he would create the circumstances by wasting money to create the narrative to tell us that we couldn't do stuff. So it wasn't him doing it. It was the lack of money, you know. And as children, you just think, oh, God, we've got no money. We better not do this because it's bad. I mean, he was an idiot, but he was instinctively a manipulator and he kind of did all of this to the extent that we grew up in a lie and really it was only when we came out of that and we started to find out from other people who had a different perspective on things and had seen into our world the, the true reasons and we almost had to reconstruct the narrative of our life and to us that was kind of what writing the book was it was trying to really gain a, a control of that narrative that our father had wrenched away from us especially with the murder note and what the media reported on. Divide and conquer is such a classic move by these abusive, manipulative men. Mm. And he'd also, he'd hurt the family pets to try and, you know, just to always keep you on your toes. Yeah. When we're looking at people who might not know that they're in that kind of relationship, how do we spot the signs? How do we try to help? What makes it really hard is that people themselves probably won't know, mm -hmm. as we had the case. So people often say, like, what if people asked you at school if you were getting abused? I was like, if you asked me at school if I was getting abused, I just would have said no, because I wouldn't have realised. It's difficult as well, because people feel like if someone's being abused, they need to get them out. But like we said as well, it's dangerous when people yeah, leave, totally. right? So it's a really difficult situation. So what you have to do is show people their experience. You have to show them through a different narrative what's really happening. But you have to kind of educate them of the risks of what's going on as well. One of the things that we found is that, yeah, when it comes to educating people, you have to understand that there's kind of a difference between short-term survival and long-term escape. When you're trying to survive an abusive situation, each day is just about functioning. You're not worrying about escaping. You're worrying about minimising the abuse and you're worrying about just getting stuff done. And in itself, is that kind of requires denial and some level of blinkering. Yeah. You just have to ignore all of this abuse and all the stress because if you focused on it, it would just destroy you. So these people who have been abused every day become very resilient, but also they learn to kind of push it to the background. Like our father was always yelling at us, but it was just, just grey noise. noise. Yeah, yeah. Like it was just like in the background, but we never it was never in the foreground. And unfortunately, that means you kind of you blunt to it and you start numbing to it and you just don't notice it. One of the things is that when you start pointing it out to people, they'll start becoming quite scared because one, they'll become really aware of, I mean, how rubbish their life is. Two, kind of how threatening it feels. But also, then they have to consider what they're going to do yeah. <laughs> and they have to know where they're going to go. And for us, our mother kept us focused on school because she knew there was no way out. We didn't have the money. If she left, there was no support network for her to look after us. Like, she would have been able to afford rent and then it would have been game over and we would have had to come back and then he would have been even more angry. 
So you have to kind of educate people, but then you push them into this painful kind of lucid awareness. But then they have to know where they're going to go and what the next step is. And for some people, they just don't have a next step. And to force them into that awareness is kind of, I mean, what they're going to do, that can just create even more trauma. And it's really difficult to, um, to help people unless you're educated yourself. So what we normally tell people who come forward to us is to call the domestic abuse hotline because they know much better than, than us, for example, the, the characteristics of that particular situation, what people should do. But I think just one of the key messages is it's so complicated in terms of trying to understand your own reality and also trying to know what to do next because a lot of the women would have been isolated. They won't have employability. They might have never worked when they leave they might not have an education often these men meet these women who are much younger than them um, because the men have an advantage because they're older they have more life experience the women are younger they're more naive and the men will ratchet the women through relationships very quickly because a really short courtship means the woman can't get to know him properly she yeah. can't find out yeah. about his past he can pretend and kind of love bomb for long enough that she feels spoiled she feels loved he can then get them and then as soon as they're dependent or whatever, or if they lost their job, or then he can sit back because they can't go anywhere. That is that is so true. So in the abusive relationship I was in, there are people going, oh my God, how did you fall for it? Which is such a stupid question. I'm like, yeah. he didn't start off that way. Yeah. He was utterly charming. And when they make you feel safe, that's when it happens because Sorry. then you're like, oh, well, it must be a blip. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe this is just another blip. And you start to, as you say, normalise it and, and blunt yourself to it. And that get, lets them escalate the That's control right. they're exerting over you. Mm. Going back to that language in the media, it doesn't help. Jilted yeah. lover, you know, seeking reconciliation. And I imagine there's an absolute tick list of the questions that you got asked. Was your mum having an affair? Yeah. Had she said anything about divorce? How was she to blame, Luke? <laughs> exactly. And that's it, isn't it? It's the fact that... I mean, the questions in themselves are one thing, but it's the line of questioning. Yeah. The fact they're trying to find out what our mum did. And it's like, just eliminate that line of questioning entirely because that is not going to help. I mean, one of the things that me and my brother say is that if you want to improve the world, you have to understand who it's failing because you need to know how to make it better. And to, like, accuse victims of doing this, that, and the other and to make no effort to listen to them is not going to allow you to overcome the problem. Like, we don't make any effort to understand victims. And unfortunately, they're killed while we're throwing these rhetorical questions at them. And the problem is that the media needs to make an effort to draw the actual patterns of abuse and homicides together and represent them as a collective problem in society as they are. And also to investigate the victim's perspective. Like I said, why? What triggered the victims to leave? You know, what? Not what triggered the murderer to kill. Like, try and find their story, and then you can understand just how difficult it is. Because I think the the perpetrator's story is a classic one to fit into a narrative of, like you said, jilted lovers, blah blah. It just fits stereotypes. But the problem with victim stories is they're so painfully complicated yeah. that I think people would just their hearts would break when they realised how difficult these people's lives are but we need to do that because otherwise we're not going to help improve the situation there's recently been an attempt to make misogyny a hate crime Mm. I wondered how you felt about that whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing I think it's um, ultimately it's what we have to do isn't it because I mean you can say we haven't got enough um, police resources which is what the police are saying (laughs) exactly you can say that but effectively you're never going to have enough police resources because misogyny is the start of the pipeline right if you think about it unfortunately childhoods is where we always seem to assert blame anyway but there is some level of the fact that the family is where most problems begin yeah and unfortunately in many cases they're kind of driven by misogyny they're driven by ideas of control they're driven by ideas of hierarchy and and children seeing their parents being abused suffer massively right and even if the children abuse themselves, it's stuff massive. And I, I didn't realise, and I think most people don't, how common all types of abuse are, whether it's sexual, physical, credit control, emotional. It's just so prevalent in our society. And unfortunately, the other thing is generally it's men doing it. And unless we actually treat that at the core issue of where it's coming from, then we're never going to stop what we're pleased having to deal with now. And the thing that I always say is people say... I don't know, mental illnesses cause this man to behave. You know, He's a criminal because of mental illness from childhood. But the thing that me and my brother say is that it doesn't matter how mentally ill you are, 
If you don't believe it's okay to hurt someone, you never will. And what people inherit from their childhoods when they go on to abuse is not mental illness, it's the idea that it's okay to hurt people. Yeah. Because there's plenty of people who have horrendous mental health generally women from being abused who don't touch a person and lots of kids like me and ryan growing up who will f- refuse to do it it doesn't matter how mentally ill we are we're not gonna hurt anyone are you not a murderer i'm you? not all right and <laughs> i don't want to, to i don't even want the excuse don't give me the excuse because i don't <laughs> want it and i think that's what we try and say is that the difficulty is that people perpetrate crimes because of their belief systems entirely yeah. and misogyny is one of the core belief systems that drives most crime and that's what a lot of people inherit from their families that's where a lot of abuse comes from and that's what they see and i think unless we actually make an effort to tackle it the police are always going to be too busy yeah so how do we change the narrative hopefully more men get involved because women have done fantastic work articulating doing the intellectual work creating institutions to help women to articulate the situation and get to the actual root of all these problems whereas men have just been feeling victimized for a very long period of time right (laughs) whereas unfortunately women have been victimized so what we need is men to stop feeling sorry for themselves stop kind of falling back into their emotions and it's really difficult right the funny thing about men is that we have this as a man you have this kind of idea of masculinity as being really stoic and strong and dull but when men actually confront feminists they're really weak and (laughs) self-pitied and quite an embarrassment and what we need is men to like kind of get over that and like grow up and actually identify that we all suffer from this like male violence as we said in the home is, is gendered and perpetrated against women but male violence is kind of everywhere. Most, yeah. like, I think, what is it, 95% of violent crimes committed by men. But actually, a lot of the victims are men as well. Yes. And men suffer from male violence. Men suffer from this limited man box that we put ourselves in. The male suicide rates are indicative of the fact that there's a problem with the idea of being a man. It's not the fact that women are causing us issues. It's not women that are henpecking us and making it happen it's the fact that we've put ourselves in this value system that doesn't work and we don't need anymore because unfortunately we have this idea that the outside world is dangerous it's full of dark alleyways and malevolent strangers but it's not it's the home that's dangerous to women most women are killed at home yeah. by men that they know and most women are raped by men that they know the problem isn't the outside world that women need protecting from they need protecting from their the men in their homes like and unfortunately the idea of man as protector is defunct now what we need is men that can care and until we get that then actually this is going to carry on because the idea that men are trying to live up to is it's way past its kind of due date and we need to change that because unless we do the police are going to be too busy <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> luke is there anything that we've not touched on that you would like to say I guess, I, I mean, I haven't had much time to talk about my sister. I think one thing that I just want to say is that they were incredible people. And often people will say to me and Ryan, you know, why aren't you, why aren't you murdering people? Because like, of your hard childhood. Come work. on, Luke. I know, come on. Get like, a hold of the mantle. Get, just, just be a man. Kill a few just people. Be a man. But the reason we're not is because we grew up with an incredible, incredible role model in our mother. And our sister was the exact same as our mother, full of love all about giving and our father was all about taking like we didn't have much growing up but our own sister would go for example to like car boot sell the random things they had which was hardly anything and go and give it to an animal shelter wood green that looked after like dogs and cats didn't have anywhere to go and things like that and they would just give and they loved to give and we learned that and and one thing that we find incredible is that we think that family requires a man and a woman and we kind of know now that it doesn't with like same sex there's single women doing incredible jobs raising kids but what we need to understand hopefully what me and ryan through who we are can show is that women alone can teach men all they need to grow up and be good men we haven't got like male characteristics can only be taught by men and female characteristics can only be taught by women all you need as a man growing up is love care and respect and then that's all you need to be a good person and women are so capable of teaching that as our mother showed and i think that mum and charlotte were all we needed to become the men we are we had a man dragging us down we would have been better without him but our mum and sister did an incredible job like inspiring us to be who we are and i think that women in general should be proud of who they are and confident that they can raise their children to be good men and good women and not and not worry about a man you know if he's not standing up to the standard that you need 
don't need him quite frankly get rid get rid but yeah. safely yeah. obviously but like get rid like you don't need a kid doesn't need a man and as a boy growing up like that I would have loved my father to have been vaporised so <laughs> I'm not I didn't I wouldn't have gone oh no I haven't got a father I would have been who let's go and do nice things so I think just the message to women is just you know believe in yourselves really that is one of the joyous and at the same time heartbreaking things in Operation Lighthouse is the love and respect for Claire and Charlotte in there and also the, the way their personalities come across like Charlotte sounded like absolute mischief in the back mm, and yeah. Claire Claire was your protector yeah absolutely and you've done an amazing job of giving them a voice and like it feels like I know them a little bit so thank you and well done yeah, thank you very much I just want to say to anyone who's listening if anything we've been talking about makes you feel like you need to reach out or seek help then then do if you feel in danger, call 999 immediately and the National Domestic Violence Free Phone Helpline, which Luke mentioned earlier, is 0808 2000 247. And Operation Lighthouse is available from all good bookshops. All the good ones, yeah. Yeah, I got mine from Waterstone. So that's a pretty good one. <laughs> That'll do, won't it? Thank you so much for coming in to talk to us. It's been a real pleasure to meet you. Yeah, thank you, Mickey.